Good evening. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event on behalf of the Department of International Development at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm a professor and head of department of the Department of International Development, Kathy Hostetler. Uh, really pleased to see so many of you here with us tonight and very pleased also to have our distinguished panelists with us. My first task is to remind you of Zoom etiquette. It looks like you're all well on top of that, have, having joined us with your cameras and your mics off to limit distractions. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that from the very beginning of this panel, you may write questions that you have at any point in the chat. And our communications manager, Deepa Patel, will be collating those and then passing them to the panelists later. Um, so please put your questions in the chat. We look forward to hearing what kinds of things you would like to have us talk about. The other part that I wanted to do in my introduction is to comment about why are we having a panel on diversity matters in international development? And as the other half of the title says, this is a way to honor our late colleague and, and much missed colleague, Professor Tandika Makandawiri. He would have been 80 this past weekend, and this is our first academic year without him. And in his person and in his research, he was really an embodiment of the idea that diversity matters in international development. He was the embodiment of many kinds of diversity, not least deeply original thinking about international development. We know that this is a discipline that's been grounded historically in colonialism and many quite exclusive ideas, but the world is more diverse than that history that we have as a discipline. And it's a real challenge. This, this is the other part of the title, that diversity is a real challenge to the study of international development. But I think what Tandika shows is that the diversity is also an opportunity that in fact, we gain real enlightenment from hearing a different voice, real enlightenment from getting access to that kind of original thinking that comes when we have many kinds of people studying international development, being part of international development processes. So the panel title is also a statement that diversity matters in a positive way in international development. And I would like very much to join our, uh, to, to, to welcome our panelists tonight. Um, and we'll be particularly now welcoming Professor Alcinda Honwana, who is the um, moderator or the chair of this evening's event. She is the strategic director at the Feroz Lajli Center for Africa and a centennial professor in the Department of International Development. Her research as an anthropologist on young people and leadership is itself a tribute to the importance of original and diverse thought in international development. We're very happy to have her at LSE and we're very happy to have her chair this discussion tonight. So I'll send it without further ado, I'll turn it over to you and join the others in listening to this really interesting panel. Thank you, Katie, thank you and welcome everyone. Welcome to the session to honor our colleague our much missed colleague, as Katie said, uh, Tandikam Kandawire. And uh, as it was also mentioned, Tandika's birthday was this weekend and we remember him today uh, in this session. And this discussion will look at Tandika's legacy and work, but also at issues that he cared about, like issues of diversity and decolonizing the academy. And we will discuss all those issues in the context of, uh, you know, what the implications are for international development. Indeed, and as we know, academic institutions have been aware of the need to decolonize the academy and decolonize the production of knowledge and create space for diverse and new epistemologies. Students have been demanding greater diversity in their curriculum as illustrated by movements such as hashtag roads must fall and other student protests. But as Kenyan novelist Ngugi Wationgu asserted, decolonization is about rejecting the centrality of the West in Africa's understanding of itself and of its place in the world. It is about, and I quote, recentering ourselves as Africans 
intellectually and culturally. And many scholars have also made the point, and for example, Anibal Quijano, uh, Latin American uh, uh, scholar, pointed out that the worst form of colonization was the, the colonize, was the colonization of the imagination. Because this type of colonization was really aimed at molding people's consciousness and sense of identity. And this also follows on what we have learned from Fanon's writings when he stated that colonialism was never simply satisfied in controlling the present and the future of the oppressed. Colonialism tenaciously distorted, disfigured and destroyed the, the, destroyed the capacity of these oppressed people to be who they are and to have their own history and their own cultures. And as some scholars have called this type of, uh, 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 um, of um, policy, they called it the epistemicide, like Boventura de Sousa Santos and others, calling, uh, referring to the homicide of non-Western epistemologies. So in this discussion about diversity and uh, creating uh, um, uh, 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 the academy in a kind of a decolonized environment and fighting for uh, uh, new um, ways of producing knowledge, um, it is important to take into account that decolonize, decolonizing the academy is not just about adding new sources of knowledge or alternative knowledge here and there, but it's fundamentally about changing power relations in the teaching and learning processes. And I think this discussion on these issues really befits Tandikam Kandawira's legacy he was a leading African economist. He was a co-founder of CODESIA, the Council for Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And uh, uh, that was that he helped uh, really build uh, in 78 and became the organization's uh, executive secretary for many years, over a decade. And uh, in fact, in a tribute to CODESIA, uh, in a tribute to Tandika, Kodesia stated, and I quote, Tandika was a brilliant economist and prodigious scholars whose works of Afri in, on African political economy challenged dominant ways of seeing the African continent on a wide range of issues that included structural adjustments and economic reform, democratic politics, neo-patrimonialism and insurgent violence. And we have today an amazing and distinguished panel to lead us in a discussion in honor of Tandika and is examine the implications of these diversity matters for international development in today's world. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome uh, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, Professor Rob Telpali, and, Professor, and uh, Dr. Kate Mayer as panelists for this session. I will introduce all of them at once and then uh, we will start with uh, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. Mahmoud Mamdani is a contemporary of Tandikam Kandawira. He's director of the Makerere Institute for Social Research in Kampala. He is also Herbert Lehman Professor of Government uh, in the Department of Anthropology and Political Science at Columbia University in New York. He was director of the Institute for African Studies at Columbia between 1999 and two, 2004. Mahmoud's work focuses on the study of African history and politics with research exploring the intersections between politics and culture and ranging from studies of colonialism and the history of civil war and genocide in Africa to human rights, the Cold War and the war on terror. 
Mahmoud has been a member of Codesria since its early days and was Codesria's president between 1998 and 2002. So Mahmoud will be our first speaker. And uh, uh, the second speaker will be Dr. Rob Talpeli. She's an assistant professor in international social and pol pol public policy at LSC. Uh, her wo she works in the intersection of critical development studies and critical African studies. Uh, her work centers on how structural transformation is conceived and contested by global, national, and trans transnational actors from crisis-affected regions of the so-called Global South. She has also conducted multi-sided fieldwork across three continents in places including Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, to Denmark, Liberia, Niger, Somaliland, United Kingdom, and the United States. And Dr. Rob Tell has been following the works of Tandikam Kandawira, and she will also tell us about some of the personal communications that she cherishes with uh, our beloved Tandika. And our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Kate Mayer. Kate is Associate Professor in Development Studies at LSE. Her work focuses on the informal economy and non-state government in Africa. Her research uh, ranges uh, uh, from change, the changing character of the informal economy in contemporary Africa to the implications of economic informalization for development, the democratization and globalization. More specifically, Kate has been examining cross-border trading systems and regional integration, the urban informal sector, the rural non-farming activities and informal enterprise associations. She has carried out field work in Nigeria, Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Kate worked closely with Tandika during the years he spent with us at LSE. But without further ado, I will invite uh, Professor Mamdani to uh, make his, uh, his presentation. Thank you. Mahmoud. Thank you very much, Alcinda. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you be. I want to thank the organizers of uh, this event for inviting me to speak. And uh, I should be very clear that uh, I accepted the invitation, or I was delighted to accept it. Um, not as much to talk about the themes uh, on which I think the rest of the panel will be speaking, uh, but much more to speak of Tandika. Uh, and to, to forefront the fact that this is uh, a, a tribute to, to Tandikam Kandaviri. If I am to use a single phrase to describe Tandika to someone younger, someone who had only read him, I would say he combined two rare attributes. He was both a complete intellectual and a complete human being. It is difficult to think of any significant aspect of human and social life that escaped Tandika's scrutiny. Not only did he read voraciously, a lot of his reading was without instrumental intent, which is very unlike uh, most of us who think of ourselves uh, as uh, professional intellectuals. He had retained the eye of a child open to newness. He could tell if and when the emperor had no clothes on. He reveled in the joy of discovery, however small or insignificant be the object of discovery. Also, he took great delight in sharing it with others. It is hard for me to remember the first time I met Tandika, 
but it must have been sometime in the 1970s before most of you were born in Kodesria. Maybe after he had returned from his one year at the Zimbabwe Institute of Development Studies. It took a decade before Tandika and I became close friends. Ours was a Dakar-based friendship. We explored much together. Whatever we could lay our eyes, our hands, or our ears on, whether ideas, food, or people. Much of it took place between official business conducted in seminars or meetings, over interminable cups of coffee in the morning and early afternoon, and beer in the evening. We went on. The name of the leading beer in Dakar is the flag. Tandika called it Front de Libération Alcoholique Gauchiste, meaning in English, Front for the Liberation of Left-Wing Alcoholics. Tandika's preferred hotel was Lagonde in Dakar. Asked why, he would say, because it's the only hotel where you see the bar before you see the reception. I shared Tandika's preference for this small boutique style hotel with modest rooms which faced the ocean and where the sound of waves against the walls of the hotel unfailingly drew you into a slumber. Tandika led a balanced life. As much as he loved to immerse himself in Dakar's drink, dance, and music-filled evenings, he found even more time to read and to exercise. His favorite mode of exercise, at least the decade, during the decade we were good friends, was skipping rope as he marked time without changing place. I remember being fascinated when I found Tandika in the midst of a rope skipping routine one morning. He asked me to try it, which I did, as he gave me a brief lecture on the many advantages of rope skipping. He then offered me his rope as a gift. I gladly accepted. The next morning, Tandika was at my door, apologizing for his mistaken judgment. I did not realize how much I could miss the rope skipping, he said. He extended his hand. I handed the gift back to him. Tandika was a man of the world, this world, in many ways. For a start, he knew much about the world he inhabited and continued to explore as if seized by a voracious appetite. He also negotiated the world incessantly, whenever possible, physically, across geopolitical boundaries, across cultural boundaries. Once we were both in New Delhi, I am from Uganda of uh, Indian heritage, third generation in East Africa. Once we were both in New Delhi, by chance, since we were attending different conferences, I introduced Tandika to the family of a friend with whom I had been at the university in the 1960s. My friend's wife had a hard time saying Tandika's last name, even remembering it. As I gathered from earlier discussion with my colleagues here, that this appears to be a frequent phenomenon. And Tandika must have devised an adequate strategy to make people comfortable um, and to get things going. So this particular time, when she, Titli was her last name, when she asked him to repeat his name twice, and then a third time, but still could not get her tongue around it, Tandika finally turned to her and said, if you find Kandawire hard to remember, just say, I'm kind of weary. Titli burst into peals of laughter, not to be outdone. She shortened his name to kind of weary. From then on, she looked for every opportunity to call him by name. What had appeared as a cultural wall 
had suddenly turned into a friendly bridge, a small example of Tandika's genius in negotiating barriers, no matter how big or small. The Cordesria fraternity, and after some time, they developed a sorority too, was among Tandika's central concerns and preoccupations. He put an enormous amount of energy into it and yet seemed to do it all effortlessly. He had a way with people. In no time, he could grasp a person's bent of mind, what made it twist or turn. He had a way of challenging us in issues big or small without evoking resentment of any sort but without downplaying it. He would often remind us of the one-sidedness of our passionately held preoccupations. As executive secretary of Codestria, as its chief administrator, he often had to, had to deal with an executive committee comprising intellectuals convinced that we not only knew how the world worked, but also how it should work. In the 80s, there was one master key to all problems, global or local, democracy. Tandika would tell us, think, think of how much of your talk on democracy is a power grab. Do not forget that Codestria is a continental body. Its membership is dispersed over the entire continent. Its representatives, the executive committee, do not meet except twice a year. The hard work of building Codestria is done by the Secretariat. Codestria can survive a weak executive committee, but it will never survive a weak Secretariat, he would add with his customary mischievous smile. Codestria was proud of its multi, multidisciplinary orientation. Tandika was perhaps amongst the first to see through this claim. He recognized one leading note in this multidisciplinary chant. This was political economy, the master discipline in the 1970s and 1980s in the African Academy. Just about everyone at Codestria, whether historian, political scientist, lawyer, or literary theorist, everyone claimed to be a political economist. Just as today, now, just about everyone claims to be decolonizing the academy. Tandika would often complain, we were building this interdisciplinary community, community on a shallow foundation. We risked weakening the ground of every discipline, including political economy, since we insisted on doubling into everything. And he cautioned us to move away from this chorus. Alcinda, do I have another five minutes or should I be? Oh, I can't hear you. You have about two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, uh, I, will, I will skip some of this. Um, another issue on which Tandika and I had, uh, or one issue on which Tandika and I had a variance was that of development. It concerned the conception of development. The discussion focused on Yerere's well-known advice to the continent. We must run while they walk. I thought this advice not particularly well conceived. It seemed to accept the goal called development, which while calling on us to gather pace and run to achieve it. Tandika took it as a version of the debate around modernity one side calling for a universal notion of modernity, the critics speaking of multiple modernities. My own sense was that a growing ecological consciousness over the past few decades called for a change in how we think of the relationship between humans and the natural environment. It calls on us to rethink the very notion of development as of modernity. All of these different updated versions of what in the colonial period was called a civilizing mission. After Tandika moved from Codestria to Unrist and from there to LSE, we had less opportunities to meet. Ours became more of an email friendship. We would often share the, 
draft of an article he intended to, to publish, and I would respond with comments. But the flow of conversation was missing. Anyway, Tandika had given up on beer since his cancer operation. I hoped to bring him to Kampala to spend a couple of weeks to give a set of lectures and spend some time traveling the countryside. But that opportunity was not to be. The last time I met Tandika at Kodesria at the General Assembly in Dakar over a drink, I don't know what he was drinking, but it was not beer. I asked how he was. His short reply was, old age sucks. We came into the world, we come into the world and inevitably pass on, leaving behind traces called memories. Amongst all colleagues, I've had the good fortune of knowing that Nika came closest to the old adage that the passing of an elder is like the loss of a library. There's much to learn from Tandika, even if he's no longer with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. Thank you for that tribute to our friend Tandika Mkandawire. I will now invite uh, Dr. Rob Tell to make her presentation. Rob Tell. Thank you so much, Alcinda. Thank you to the in um, organizers of this event. I'm actually quite humbled to be a part of this panel. Um, I want to say, may the soul of our dearly departed Tandika rest in perfect power. So what, what do movements for racial and epistemic justice have in common with Tandika's towering contributions to the field of development? Well, they are fundamentally about rupture in the same way that Tandika's entire body of scholarship, his entire body of work was about rupture. We've seen calls for a historical reckoning with the past and the present. We've seen calls for redistributing resources. We've seen calls for recognizing the preferably unheard and the deliberately silenced in the words of Indian activist and author Arundhati Roy. And we've seen calls for a reconstruction of alternative futures. Now these movements have forced us as development scholars, as practitioners and policymakers to address the legacies of capitalism. So slavery, colonialism, and imperialism, and their 21st century manifestations. They have forced us, and Tandika has forced us, to interrogate poverty, power, and privilege, where they're actually situated, why, and how this actually came to be so. These movements and Tandika's work have forced us to deconstruct development, I would argue, in seven fundamental ways, and I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. So the first is they forced us to decenter the Euro-American white gaze of development. Um, I have argued previously, not only in a keynote at the Development Studies Association conference in 2019, but more recently in a development and change article entitled Decentering the White Gaze of Development, that development fundamentally, fundamentally suffers from a white gaze problem. Now, what is the white gaze of development? It's borrowed from the work of intellectuals and literary icons such as Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, who challenged one dimensional racist tropes about blacks in America. Now the white gaze of development is fundamentally the assumption that Western whiteness and modernity are the primary signifiers of progress against which all others are deemed deviant, inferior and incomplete. Now develop meant is structured along hierarchies of race and place, but there's this glaring silence on race and racism, not only in the scholarship, but also in policy and practice. Now the silence around race in development allows for Western practitioners and scholars of development to avoid being accountable for the unearned powers and privileges that actually derive from whiteness. This is an argument that Uma Kothari makes in her really important article in Progress and Development Studies in 2006. Now, while global domination and structural inequalities are constituted by economic power, they're actually reinforced and justified by racial power, an argument that Cedric Robinson makes in his 1983 book, Black Marxism, in which he coins the term racial capitalism. Kalpana Wilson's 2012 book, Race, Racism, and Development, makes similar arguments. Now, I've suggested previously that the importance of mainstreaming race as an anti-racist agenda for development in the same way that Marxist and feminist scholars have mainstreamed class and gender respectively. Now I sent this development and change article to Tandika um, and he responded really quickly. 
exactly on October 18, 2019. And he says, and I quote, hi, thanks for the article. I enjoyed reading it and will share it. Keep on pushing, Tandika. Now I'm not one for sentimentality, but I have to admit that receiving that article completely buoyed me up as a young scholar who has looked at Tanzika as an example of um, a scholar practitioner and somebody who engages with scholarship as an activist. So I've kept that particular email as one of my cherished emails. I think secondly, the movements for racial and epistemic justice have forced us to reconcile the debate between international development and global development. So whereas proponents of global development argue that there has been an increase in inequalities within countries, and a decrease in inequalities between countries of the, the so-called global North and South. So the rise of the South or convergence. Proponents of international development argue that historical inequalities between regions and countries actually persist today. But I don't really see this as an either or scenario, but rather a both and scenario. So we as development scholars, as practitioners, as policymakers should be addressing both inequalities between countries and inequalities within countries. Now, why is that? Because analyzing race forces us to see development in quotation marks as a global challenge, not solely as a predicament of the so-called global South, because people of color experience limited statehood, material deprivation, grinding poverty, and inequality in the so-called global North at alarming rates, an argument that Amartya Sen makes in his 1999 book, Development is Freedom. So COVID, for example, is a primary example of how non-whiteness can be considered a site for analyzing the, ne the nexus between inequities of health and wealth. Now these movements for epistemic and racial justice have also pushed scholars to take up the charge of what some scholars have called anthropologizing the West. So interrogating systems of racial domination, of studying up and critiquing how power and influence in the so-called global North is derived, how it functions, how it operates and its dysfunctionalities. Now, thirdly, these movements for epistemic and racial justice have pushed us to come up with a completely new lexicon for describing people, places, and processes within the context of development. Now, this new lexicon would acknowledge the challenges of socioeconomic transformation in the so-called global South, so why some impediments and change are inherently produced, while also speaking about these issues in a way that is respectful and dignified. So in this vein, we are forced to question colonial binaries such as the so-called global north, the so-called global south, developing versus developed. We're now interrogating the blasphemy of calling Europe and America developed when the UK and the US, for instance, have bungled responses to COVID-19 in stark contrast to countries like Singapore, Cuba, and Mauritius, which have reportedly responded with more efficiency and compassion. We're also increasingly having to reckon with non-mainstream development actors such as Brazil and Colombia and Vietnam and South Africa, how they actually do development differently through South-South exchanges of goods, ideas, knowledge, and policy frameworks. Fourth, movements for epistemic and racial justice as well as Tandika's work have reminded us that the struggles for epistemic justice must, must, must accompany struggles for social justice. So development scholars like us can't remain cloistered in our ivory towers pontificating about these issues. We've got to align our research agendas with social justice movements against inequality and injustice. We've got to amplify these causes. We've got to document their successes and failures because with the privilege of intellectual autonomy also comes a responsibility to speak truth to power, which Tandika did over and over and over again in his very, very long career. Five, what have the movements for racial and epistemic justice and Tanzika's work done? They forced us to take cue from the Black Lives Matter movement, which demands divestment. So the movement for Black Lives is calling for radical redistribution of resources. So moving funds from policing into Black communities that have been at the receiving end of anti-Black police violence. This has also forced us in the development sector to shift our focus from obsessing over aid to seriously considering reparations, recognizing that aid is not altruistic, but rather strategic, and that it also always serves the interests of the so-called donor. Six, these movements for epistemic justice and racial justice and Tandika's work have forced us to begin dismantling the system of unequal remuneration and development based on passport tiers and racial hierarchy. So that, that means in universities and research centers and think tanks, NGOs, 
multilateral organizations as well as the private sector. So we should be thinking about paying people according to their contextual expertise and knowledge and not the color of their passports or the color of their skin. Furthermore, hiring practices should be about rupture, not tokenism or maintaining the status quo by just hiring more people of color, especially if these people of color reproduced problematic tropes, policies, and procedures. Lastly, movements for epistemic and racial justice, as well as Tandika's life body of work, have forced us to transcend anti-racist solidarity statements. Now, I've actually developed quite a healthy cynicism around solidarity statements in the past six months. In most cases, I find them to be disingenuous, insincere, and performative in the way that some decolonizing movements are disingenuous, insincere, and performative. Instead, I think we should be strategizing and making concrete plans for how we actually address racism and development within our institutions, be they multilateral development institutions, UN agencies, NGOs, or university development departments. Now, lastly, I wanna end with some reflections about Tandika, uh, my own personal reflections about Tandikas. So as Mahmoud mentioned, there's an African proverb that says that when an elder dies, an entire library burns down right before our very eyes, the pages of its books engulfed in flames. Now, Tandika's death stunned many of us who, who drew on the wisdom of his foundational texts as critical scholars. And though we are deeply, deeply, deeply saddened that he is no longer with us, he actually left us an entire library intact. He deftly straddled the world of scholar, practitioner, and policymaker, and showed us the importance of interdisciplinary thinking, of resisting the urge to be disciplined, his large body of scholarship offers us a masterclass in deconstructing development. He made turning received wisdoms about Africa upside down into an art form on everything from theorizing the developmental state in Africa to debunking notions about neo-patrimonialism in the continent. For this, we are forever indebted. In particular, Tandika's 2004 edited volume, Social Policy in a Development Context, has been an instrumental in helping me understand the continuities and discontinuities between social policy and development as politically fraught scholarly issues of, of scholarly inquiry. For this, I remain forever inspired to keep pushing as he encouraged me to do in his October 18, 2019 email. So again, may his soul rest in perfect power and I'm deeply, deeply honored to have known his work and to have have exchanged an email with him once in my lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Rob Dell. Thank you for that powerful tribute also to Tandika, but also for your reflections on ideas about decolonizing the academy, but uh, about racism and inequalities and the linkages with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. We will move on to Dr. Kate Mayer. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who have joined us this evening and give special greetings to any members of Tandika's family who have joined us either on Zoom or on the uh, live stream on YouTube. Um, as some of you may know, though I suspect very few of you, um, this actually is Canadian Thanksgiving as well as uh, a time that is very close to Tandika's 80th birthday and uh, a good time to celebrate him. And as a Canadian myself, um, holding this event on Canadian Thanksgiving has a, a dual symbolism for me. The first one is that Tandika remains an inspirational scholar as we've heard already from our previous two speakers who has given us so much to give thanks for his institution building work in uh, Codestria, the African Social Science Institute, and in the UN through the UNRISD, the treasure trove of publications he's left for us, his wonderful teaching and support for African students at the LSE, and his critical but optimistic development vision. On the other hand, Thanksgiving is also a feast filled with ambivalence when it comes to issues of diversity. And these kinds of concerns about diversity are not really addressed by putting a few extra native Canadians in the Thanksgiving play. 
So remembering Tandika really is about shifting our attention beyond just the issues, just the, the surface issues of race, beyond the tokenism to the deeper meaning of calls for diversity in international development. Um, Rob Tell referred to some of the performative dimensions of anti-racist uh, statements. And it's really important to get past this performative dimension and start thinking about what diversity in development is really all about. It's not about box ticking exercises or photo opportunities. It's really about the deepening of knowledge through diversity of perspectives. But the ways in which diversity ensures approaches to knowledge production that keep the focus on self-determination, on social justice, as well as economic growth, and uphold conventional theory and practice to account. Now, Tandika was not just an African scholar teaching development in a global institution of higher learning. He brought to his work a prodigious knowledge of African political economy and a profound intellectual imagination. It was born of his ability to understand many aspects of colonialism, national strug nationalist struggles, governance, institutions, and structural adjustment from the inside, as well as from the outside as an academic. Pandika was also in many ways a highly disciplined interdisciplinary scholar. His attention to rigor was meticulous. He was critical of all perspectives, of all ideologies. If it didn't stand up to scrutiny, as far as Tandika was concerned, it didn't stand up. Tandika himself here at the LSC followed in the illustrious footsteps, uh, in, sorry, followed in illustrious footsteps in shaking up development thinking here. The Nobel Prize winning development economist, Sir Arthur Lewis, originally from St. Lucia, made his mark both as a student and as a member of staff in the LSE in the 1930s and 40s. Andiga was not the first renowned black development economist at the LSE, and his contributions to the field certainly show us why we need many more. In my contribution, I want to follow, focus here on diversity in terms of its implications for development knowledge and to focus on two main dimensions, on diversity of development ideas and on diversity in training and research collaboration. And I'll just go through some, some of the issues very quickly. Certainly in terms of ideas, the diversity in the body of students and academics brings new thinking that challenges the mainstream. It's this challenging of the mainstream through new ideas and new perspectives is really more important than ever in this time of multiple crises of economic instability, of coronavirus, of global inequality, and political and social legitimacy. The need to think out the box, the sense that some of our standard paradigms are growing a bit thin, are a little bit uh, unable to, to are, are less able to tackle the real crises of our times, is, is becoming increasingly prominent, both in uh, international development studies and in a number of other uh, fields. Along with my senior colleagues on the panel here, Tandika was decolonizing the curriculum and thinking outside this box long before decolonization of the curriculum was a thing. The contributions of scholars like uh, Alcinda Hanwana and uh, Mahmoud Mandani are first and foremost about the ideas that they brought to the issues of development. It's, it's really about diversity of thinking, but those ideas would not have come out in the same way. They would, wouldn't have emerged if these people were not who they are and ha didn't have the experiences that they have. Through Professor Mamdani, issues like the myth of population control, uh, the new thinking about citizen and subject in uh, the, the whole issues of, of citizenship in, uh, in various parts of Africa. Professor Hanwana's work on weighthood with respect to understanding African youth. Um, all of these are really incisive ways that have expanded our understanding of development, our perspectives on development thinking. And Tandiga also brought a number of incisive ideas about African developmental states, his research program on transformative social policy, which uh, really developed a more effective development model for late, late, late developers, targeted particularly at uh, African countries and other very late developers. He looked at the ways in which new ideas, new models, 
uh, new, uh, new ways of approaching development issues can be brought to leapfrog older problems and older perspectives and think of uh, ways forward when, when earlier models weren't working. So instead of pathologizing, Tandika innovated in, in thinking about development. Now, all of these ideas from the various scholars on this panel and from Tandika have expanded our ability to think about development problems. And I'm sure Rob Tell will be bringing her own angle to this as she develops as a scholar. Um, they, they help us to develop more innovative theory and more innovative policy solutions. And this connects really to the LSE's motto to understand the causes of things, which pushes us to seek diversity of ideas that expands our understanding of complex issues that challenges and stretches the conventional wisdom and informs and improves policy. A focus on diversity then highlights the problems of ignoring colonial legacies and racial inequality that can reinforce conventional thinking and perpetuate the ills that development is supposed to address. We've been hearing in the various Black Lives Matter protests about the, blind, the ways in which the blindness to racial injustice can be crystallized in some of the statues in public squares and in universities. The whole issue of Rhodes Must Fall and the statue of Rhodes in Oxford, the uh, Edward Colston uh, situation in Bristol, um, and the, the growing pressure to remove or at least to historically contextualize some of the um, racially, or sorry, of the um, uh, colonially dubious ter uh, actors turned philanthropists who have made their way into our history. Now, similar types of blindness are also baked into some of our development theories. Some of the, the economic equations that have become famous or been part of famous articles. And more recently into the algorithms that are shaping a growing range of modernized activities in production, service provision, uh, employment uh, processes, et cetera. So the, the whole idea of the ways in which um, racial inequality, in which uh, uh, colonial injustices are baked into uh, development thinking is not a problem of quantitative or qualitative methods. It's really about thinking through the assumptions that underpin theories or methods that are used. One of my favorite pieces of Tandika's work was actually a quantitative article called On Tax Efforts and Colonial Heritage in Africa. And like the famous article on a similar subject by Achimoglu, Johnson and Robinson, Tandika uses econometric analysis to examine how colonial legacies have shaped the developmental capacity of institutions in a range of African countries in, in particular in this article. Where the econometric equations of Achimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson see settler economies as implanting good Western institutions that promoted successful development, Tandika uses historical as well as econometric analysis to show how settler economies also systematically eradicated local economic and political institutions in the places where they were transplanted. In the, the, the process, a range of uh, business institutions, economic uh, uh, forms of organization were smashed. And the, that was really very much the approach was to smash any local economic institutions that would compete for labor with the mines and the settler farms. This created uh, efficiency and uh, developmental, um, uh, successful developmental performance, but it also had a more negative effect on the ways in which local actors were able to organize and, and develop a, a form of economic autonomy. And this throws really a new light on what good institutions were doing in various parts of Africa. Nowadays, changing perceptions of the role of local institutions in development um, help us see these issues a bit more clearly. Ideas of hybrid governance, of the entrepreneurial dynamism of the informal economy really are forcing a rethink of what constitutes good institutions for development. Former settler economies in Southern Africa may have more Western institutions, but they have turned out to have be quite a weak source of local business ecosystems 
that are now seen as productive in the context of bottom of the pyramid organization um, and other types of uh, business connections in the process of, of globalization. So Tandika emphasized the folly of what he called institutional monocropping and monotasking, the title of one of his other articles, in the context of development thinking. He felt that the stripping down of institutions to their barest economic functions was a mistake in the context of African development, and that it was really important to, to understand how institutions needed to have a diversity of functions in economic, in judicial, and in political activity, that institutions were responsible for building not just external investor confidence, but internal political stability, economic dynamism, and social cohesion. So stripping institutions down to single functions actually undermined their effectiveness at political and economic development. In international development here, the need, we need really to diversify not only who we read in the curriculum, but what we read and to give students the conceptual ammunition to challenge prevailing theories or models of where Africa fits in the development process or where other regions fit in the development process. And very much, I think, as Rob Tell said, to be aware of the ways in which race uh, changes the development equation in, uh, in what are called developed countries as well as developing countries. Um, and Tandika, as uh, has been pointed out already, left a huge bibliography of works. We'll post the link. Codestria has prepared a, a, a detailed bibliography and students can sift through and find things that help them perhaps develop an argument when some of the the theories that, or models that they're being taught don't strike them as quite right. Because my experience has often been, when I'm not comfortable with something, I stumble across some art, article Tandika wrote some years ago and begin to understand why that didn't sit right, right with me. He really does provide the conceptual ammunition you need to challenge some of these mainstream development theories. Now, very quickly, I want to uh, highlight a, a second issue and that relates to the importance of diversity in not just decolonizing the curriculum and expanding our approach to development thinking, but also to um, creating diversity in more practical dimensions of development training and research collaboration. There have been longstanding tensions about the tendency of some disciplines to crowd out alternative perspectives. In colonial times, there were tensions around the role of anthropology in creating very stiff frameworks about uh, how development worked and how societies work. And in contemporary times, orthodox economics has come in for some criticism. Often, uh, if capacity building in particular disciplines and particular methodologies only teaches the theories and techniques of the dominant powers, um, it fails to enable scholars from diverse backgrounds to bring their own experience to the theorizing of development processes. And that can be a problem. Tandika often used to say, and one of what he saw as one of the purposes of, of CODESRIA, the African Social Science Research Institute, is that Africans cannot leave the theorizing of Africa to non-Africans. They have to get in on it themselves and use their experience and knowledge of the continent and of the society and of the, the, their own history to, to develop theories that more effectively grasp all of those dimensions. Concerns in regard to somewhat uh, narrow approaches to, uh, to uh, African development and to development more broadly have been raised about the role of the Nairobi-based African Economic Research Consortium, the AERC, which played an aggressive role in displacing more heterodox structuralist perspectives to the teaching of economics in the African university system, uh, particularly from about the late 1980s when structural adjustment was biting and universities were struggling to keep up with their own agendas and their own approaches to teaching. The AERC has actively promoted a narrow version of economic analysis among universities and among policymakers across Africa under the guise of capacity building 
and creating the capacity for excellence in the development of policy. But Tandika often uh, referred to this as highly problematic and actually has an entire article on his concerns about the AERC and its role in African development thinking and policy making. Similar concerns nowadays are being raised about the explosive rise of randomized control trials and attend their tendency to crowd out other approaches to research and to the study of development issues. While in many ways this kind of capacity, capacity building in, in econometric techniques or in randomized control trials can be very valuable and certainly is a useful addition to skills in a number of disciplines, it can undermine the purpose of diversity among development scholars if only a narrow range of approaches are taught and recognized as valid. And less local scholars are given space to influence the choice of methodologies and of policy design, capacity building, or at least narrow forms of capacity building, risk becoming a post-colonial version of the civilizing mission. So narrow approaches to methodological training uh, or to working out how to build uh, knowledge into policy uh, approaches can reduce developing country scholars to hewers of wood and gatherers of data and end up reinforcing rather than overcoming colonial relationships in academia and in policy development. At the level of collaboration as well, there's now a lot more emphasis on involving developing country scholars in carrying out projects and as co-authors on papers. But this can just become another form of tokenism and co-option if local scholars have little to say in what is researched and how. Narrowing how we study development defeats the purpose of diversity, even if cohorts of students and academics become more globally and racially diverse. The COVID era with travel and research bans in force in many institutions of the global north provides new opportunities for more diverse forms of research collaboration between scholars in the global north and south, which in many ways is a positive thing. Uh, in particular, Southern scholars need to use this opportunity to leverage more influence in the research process rather than um, put, being put in a situation where they simply become data gatherers for other people's agendas. So I think the, the um, final issue that, that uh, I want to bring out is that diversity is not just about dressing up the same intellectual message and practices in a rainbow coalition. It's about scrutinizing assumptions, ideas, and practices from the perspective of non-white, non-Northern scholars and students, and using the insights gained to develop better theory and to sharpen disciplinary rigor. Because having our assumptions challenged is precisely the path to rigor. This is Tandika's legacy to ID, to the LSE, into the field of development economics. And I and many others in ID are better scholars for having engaged with Tandika's ideas and are richer for having known him. And I hope this new cohort of ID students will make the most of the rich intellectual legacy that Tandika has left behind and will carry the torch of critical and original development thinking for the benefit of future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for your beautiful tri tri tribute to our colleague, but also for looking at or discussing issues regarding diversity within international development. As you mentioned, diversity of ideas, diversity of experience, and beyond all these tokenisms, and really dealing with issues of power relations and how that can be uh, that can help develop uh, uh, theory, theoretical and intellectual knowledge about Africa that is built from uh, local insights. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we will now move on to the question and answer session. And uh, at this point, I think we want to say thank you to all uh, our, um, to our audience on YouTube. Thank you very much.